I'm Caitlin. Kia ora, how are you me? Kia ora. Um, so what are you studying at uni? Um, I'm studying sociology and I'm minoring in writing studies. Cool. What are you doing? Um, I am doing a law conjoint with a BA in psychology. So I just finished my second year, so I'm still like a oh, cool. bit of a newbie. <laughs> um, okay, so should we? Yeah, let's go, let's go for it. Do you want to, you started, so you have to start again. Oh, okay. You have to, you have to go for it. Um, all right. Um, so, can you tell me about your background a little bit and um, if you identify with a particular ethnic group and like how that ethnicity is important to you? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I am Māori. My iwi are Ngāpahi me Te Rarawa, me Ngāti Hine, depending on if you think Ngāti Hine is an iwi or not, but it's <laughs> a much longer conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. People get real mad about that one. <laughs> um, but my, my family moved to Auckland in the 30s, so I've been open Māori since then. So I've never been to the door here or anything. Oh, okay. Um, but how about how about you? What are you? Um, I identify as Pakeha. Um, my family came here with sort of the original settlers, but before that, um, I guess my family mainly came from Scotland and Germany. But um, I just identify as a Pakeha Kiwi. Um, yeah. So um, in your in your sort of um, written answers and things, you discussed um, how racism exists in social and systemic structures of society. So can you explain this a little bit further? Yeah, I mean, it's like a typical, like a Māori question is that we're gonna have to start with a long historical anecdote. So- <laughs> we'll go for it. <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna go all the way back to 1835 mm -hmm. when we had Hefaka which was like a declaration of independence by mm -hmm. the Northern Iwi, <coughs> which was ratified by um, the British state which um, was basically like a declaration of independence saying that we're not British subjects and we, we run ourselves in our own shit. And they were all totally fine with that for about five years. Mm. And then they had the Treaty of Waitangi, <coughs> which you know now they claim is a foundation docu document for the New Zealand state. Um, and it's kind of where I see the, the beginning of like formal racism in this country was where um, sovereignty was taken from Rangatira mm. and um, handed over to agents of the British Crown um, and ever since then, we've been kind of playing catch up to Pākehā, <coughs> who have had their own government and their own sovereignty. Their property rights got respected and ours didn't. <coughs> Our property got taken off and handed to them <laughs> to pay off invading us. <laughs> um, <coughs> so I think when you kind of talk about racism in this country and how we're meant to deal with it, I think it's a little bit naive not to start with looking at the, um, you know, the structures that this country depends on to exist, like our state, which has no constitutional sovereignty or like the, the agents of that state, like the police and the armed forces and corrections. Mm. Um, I think it's kind of, I think it's naive to look at interpersonal relationships and not look at the structures of power that underlie those. Mm. So how do you think that we can kind of um, use that to rectify the wrongs in society? And like, do you think we could do it through education or how do you think it's best to attack it in a systematic way and kind of, get the ball rolling. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, if you look at the history of this country, every time the New Zealand government has thought that Māori did not want them to be in charge, look at the Flagstaff War where <coughs> my ancestors were killed fighting at Ruapeka Peka. So <coughs> that was one time that the New Zealand government thought that Māori didn't want them to be in charge. You know, I don't know if there is any amount of education that can really fix these like deep structural white supremacist um, tendencies in this country. So um, I think it needs to be done on the level of politics rather than on educating individuals, you know? Mm. Okay, so like start at the top and it'll filter down. And yeah, like radical political overhaul needs to occur if we're ever gonna get anything approaching, you know, ethnic equality in this country. Being a law student, um, you come across a lot of sort of misconceptions about the targeted admission schemes. And um, most recently I was actually in a, in a psychology tutorial and we were talking about discrimination and I said, well, um, we haven't really had the conversation about positive discrimination in ways that that can, you know, help uh, indigenous groups or minorities, such as things like the targeted admissions scheme. And um, people often, or non Māori Pacific students, often perceive it as negative discrimination against those who aren't helped by it. Mm. Um, <coughs> and it was, it was quite shocking, <laughs> some of the responses that I got, especially from students who are exposed to, you know, various ethnicities every day. And, you know, I, I would have said should be open-minded. Um, I had one girl put up her hand and said, so, <laughs> um, 
why should I apologize for being white? <laughs> Which, <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, that really ground my gears, and I just <laughs> thought you're, you're just undermining the whole, the whole, the whole dialogue we should be having, um, and you're sort of <laughs> you are backtracking if any any work that's been done, such such the target mission schemes to try and achieve any sort of equality, um, and I think people often often misperceive the schemes as you know helping one group but not another, mm. and I you know I try and. I tried to diplomatically point out, <laughs> you know, in, in the nicest way possible, that it's th there needs to be better awareness, especially at the university, about why the schemes are in place, and that it's to try and balance social inequities that we have created, that we've had a hand in creating, and everyone has a responsibility to try and try and right things um, in any way possible, and it's not as though Māori Pacific students are getting an easy road. They're getting mm. a leg up because they need it. Because we've we've built this this unequal social structure, this education, this political, this social structure. Um, and I mean, I still have a lot more to learn about it personally. Um, but I just find people's ignorance about it quite worrying. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, how do you feel about the admissions schemes yourself? Yeah. I mean. Um I, I don't know if I got in through one or not because I'm. I mean, I, I see it on my admission stuff that I'm Maori and stuff, so the university knows that in some kind of vague databasey sense. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, like it's not um, something that people talk about why it needs to be there. They just talk about it as like a, a form of discrimination mm. rather than looking at other forms of discrimination that are probably worse. Like if 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 we accept that targeted admission schemes are racism against Pākehā, and I don't. You know, I would <laughs> I would gladly accept no. that discrimination rather than you know police brutality or mm. mass incarceration or just white supremacist street violence. You know, like <coughs> if if it were discrimination, it would be the easiest, weakest, nicest discrimination that anyone's ever had to put up with in the history of the world. And that's the best racism that I could possibly ask for. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just think that people see it as this kind of tool for discrimination, separation of, of groups, but I I see it as a tool for greater inclusiveness and this balancing of the scales yeah. in some, at least some small way mm. in, in, our, in the university, in, in a place that should be um, open and equal and we should be hearing everyone's voices. Um, so yeah, that's sort of, and I think that in terms of the targeted admission schemes, particularly, um, as you said, like we should be explaining why they're in place yeah, totally. instead of just handing them over and saying, you know, some people can do this, some people can do that. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's sort of, that's my view on, <laughs> on them. And I think that um, there, there are huge misperceptions about it, particularly with things like law, where there is a certain, um, you know, GPA that you have mm. to achieve to get in, in medicine. Um, and people feel, a lot of people feel entitled as to whether they should be, you know, getting in or whether everyone should have to achieve the same grades but mm. it's just a it's a foot in the door yeah that's all it is mm. you know everyone has to put in the same work yeah you have to get the same grades to actually exactly. qualify for stuff anyway so it's yeah. not like yeah it's ridiculous mm. all right shall we move on <laughs> to the next yeah let's, let's um okay so in terms of inclusivity at the university do you feel um, a sense of inclusiveness or belonging at the university um, and do you feel that there are places to connect with other students yeah, I mean, I don't think the university could survive having the kinds of communities within it that I would feel comfortable within as someone with my um, whakapapa and political understandings of mm. the society. If there were enough students that we had like a unified block, um, <coughs> I don't think that the university's present administrative practices could continue because those are clearly racist mm. um like the, uh, i so no i definitely don't feel included in how the university meant to function because it's meant to preclude people being able to have those kinds of connections with each other you know like it's meant to be a processing mill for people to come in get a qualification go out and become middle managers mm. um and i'm not really interested in that and the people who i do connect with at the university you know they don't connect with that either so i mean <coughs> the people who i find who i do kind of um click with um that's definitely in spite of the the uni's intended functioning, you know. 
Um, like how about how about you? How do you find it? Um, I I actually don't feel a sense of inclusiveness um, or belonging at the university at all. I don't I don't feel excluded per se. It's more that I don't feel that the university as as a whole has a cohesive sense of community mm. or um, or university identity. But in terms of groups within the university, I think that often smaller groups can kind of um, come together but but stay separate from from the rest and I think that that sort of undermines a general sense of inclusivity. I think I'm lucky in terms of law um, because we have sort of a slightly separate um, set of buildings. Yeah, you're all the way over. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> a little bit removed so there is that kind of sense of law community. Um, but I think for a lot of other subjects and faculties, especially things like arts, which is yeah. so huge and so many people do it and there are so many different facets within it, I don't feel any sort of sense of connection to anyone in arts um, yeah. or anything particularly related to the university mm. um, or any group per se. Yeah, I mean, it's weird, like, the university to try to relate to people here because, like, who is the university, you know? Mm. Like, we're, we're meant to be here as... as um, citizens of the university <laughs> almost. But um, like in terms of our actual capacities to connect with each other, we've got like a quad, which is a barren concrete block, <laughs> basically. <laughs> like, um, like getting really down to the, the buildings and everything. Yeah, and like Arts, arts One is nice. So that like the Human Sciences Building feels like a hospital. <laughs> like it's yeah. so difficult to try to form any kind of community when the, um, mm. you know, all of the money is being spent over in you know, law, sorry, no, <laughs> or in the engineering <laughs> building. Like they're pushing so hard for STEM and law and like arts, which is the biggest and brownest of all of the mm. um, disciplinary areas gets like nothing. Um, do you think that we could introduce more shared spaces? Or do you think, what, what's the kind of way you think we should approach? Yeah, I think that? more like, um, more just like human like habitats, you know, like it's, mm. I don't think you could just stick people together like a zoo and expect them to get along. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like um, the ecology at the university is so like striated, you know, like it's so hierarchical. Like you've got like <coughs> postgrads never talk to undergrads except for tutorials, and lecturers never talk to anyone if they can avoid it. <laughs> generally, <coughs> um, you know, like everyone's being centralised into these weird areas, like. Um, all of the admin staff have been laid off and now we've got like three for all of arts and the arts one building so you never actually spend any time in your disciplinary areas offices where you might run into one of your lecturers and be able to have like a human conversation with them mm. like what do you think about like shared areas and stuff because i know it's probably different in law yeah i mean with law again we're so we're kind of removed from the rest of the university um but i think that there need to be more shared spaces especially like interacting staff and students um where everyone can sort of come together other than places like the Quad. Um, um, and I think it's nice in, say, the Commerce Building, um, the business OGGB, um, because that's quite a nice open area. But again, it's mainly used by business students. There's a cafe and you often do see lecturers and tutors and everything mm. there. And it would be nice if we had um, more or, or bigger spaces yeah. where all different um, faculties, students, staff could interact, um, and yeah, more sort of human spaces mm. um, where it's just natural to go and and meet up with people and have your lunch and everything. You're not having to go and find a cafe or yeah, totally. having to um, stay in these little groups. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that the university needs to kind of improve on that personally. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, what are some of the major challenges you believe ethnic minorities experience on campus? So, that includes um, both social and academic and anything um, within the university. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, it gets back to like what the university is meant to be for. Like, <coughs> it's sort of like a training ground for, you know, economic advancement. And <coughs> often that's really hard for us because you don't have the money to get in. So first of all, just the fact that there's not many of us here mm. and those of us who are here are in underfunded departments like art, so we don't actually get the resources that we need to like, <coughs> even by the university's like standards, like pass papers and get 
a qualification that we can put on our CV. Mm. Like there's not enough of us here in the first place to actually achieve that. And like when we do come here, the, um, on like a political level, we don't get the um, armament, academically speaking, that we need to be able to like analyze and understand our place in society because all of the lecturers are also Pākehā, you know? Mm. There's like, I think the University of Auckland has like five to 10%, I mean, it's definitely less than 10%, um, Māori staff and <coughs> everyone else is Pākehā and Tauewe. So like I don't know if I can trust them to um, honour like the, the history of this country and like teach us accurately about <coughs> the kind of structures of power that we're enmeshed in, you know? Mm. Um, so yeah, I think like getting here is a struggle definitely for brown people at the university. But then once we actually get here, whether we're going to be taught anything worth knowing, <laughs> I don't know that either, you know? Yeah, I, I definitely think that from my point of view, there needs to be a much greater um, diversity in terms of the staff, mm. in terms of Māori Pacific representation. And I think the content in the various papers, I, I had um, in a psychology paper, <laughs> we already had this conversation, don't judge. Um, <laughs> um, we had a, an entire section on indigenous perspectives, which I found so fascinating because as a Pākehā, I, you know, I have, exposure in daily life to Māori Pacific peoples but I don't have that that kind of um, intrinsic sort of spiritual connection um, and, and it's hard for me to understand so to learn more about it is great mm. and then I went up to my lecturer at the end and said so when is there going to be some sort of um, indigenous perspectives paper um, a, c a cultural paper anything Māori perspectives anything and she said oh well Never. Yeah, not not at the moment. <laughs> it, it was so disappointing for me. Yeah. And so of course, you know, I put it in the um, at the end of uh, end of the the paper um, kind of feedback. But I really think that there just needs to be a greater push mm -hmm. um, to disseminate wider perspectives and for it to be taught yeah. by by Maori Maori Pacific staff. Um, we learned, as you, as you do with law, about the Treaty of Waitangi mm. and about um, sources of Māori customary rights. Again, great, fascinating. I found it extremely interesting, the case of like Takamori and Clark, um, where there was dispute over who had rights to uh, the body of, of a young Māori man who died. And although I thought it was extremely worthwhile learning about, I felt it was quite sanitised, there was no political insight and it's, a, it's an inherently, as you said, a political, a social mm. issue, you can't, you can't separate it yeah. um, when we're learning about uh, Māori history mm. and I think that that's something that we need to incorporate a lot more in our courses. Yeah, I mean like because the university is such a um, capitalised institution, you know, like it's all um, bent towards producing as much profit as it can, which it's doing a fabulous job at. It's the first billion dollar tertiary education in the country. They're making the most profits out of anyone <laughs> in tertiary education. So they can't um, reckon, well, they can't teach tikanga Māori, truly, because tikanga Māori is, I would say, like, functionally anti-capitalist. Mm -hmm. Everything was held in common, you know, so they can't teach us about, like, oh, by the way, money is fake, because then, you know, then you look like an idiot giving them 20 grand every year, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it can be taught per se. Yeah, I mean, they, they can't live it, like, because then they'd have to disestablish themselves because they're on unceded Māori land. Oh, yes, <laughs> that's another <laughs> issue, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, every day when I walk to the library to go study, I walk past the ruins of a colonial era fort that was built mm -hmm. to stop my ancestors coming back here if we wanted our homes back, you know? Mm -hmm. There's rifle slits in there for them to shoot us through. <laughs> so how do you think that the university could acknowledge that that history? What, what do you think the university should do? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, the, they need to build like 40 marae here. There's one and it's in the parking lot. <coughs> like the the hiring practices are obviously racist if there's no Māori teaching anything except Māori studies, people who want to do Māori studies. You should have to learn Māori stuff because you're in a Māori country on Māori land, you know, like it should be inescapable. <coughs> um, it just seems ridiculous that this place builds itself as a whare wānanga or tāmaki makoto, and then no one gets even taught what tāmaki makoto is, you know. I've had lecturers not know that before. Mm. I've, like it's just so sanitised and depoliticised and it's made safe so that the university can keep doing what it needs to do, which is make money for its shareholders. 
<clears throat> and I don't think that's compatible with anti-racism because people who have money, people who get money, are all Pākehā. Um, in the future, when you witness like examples of like subtle racism, like I mentioned before, like a, like lecturers saying mm. dumb shit, like what will you feel like you need to do, or like how how do you deal with subtle racism? I think um, subtle racism, when especially when it's ambiguous, when uh, for instance it's something that I haven't necessarily experienced myself, um, I think it can be very challenging to step in if you are afraid that you might be in the wrong. But I personally would feel obliged to step in. Um, even if it was a lecturer who, who you looked up to. Um, confrontation, I don't think, is always the best way. I think sometimes it's the best way to be heard. Um, but even taking someone aside and saying, and mentioning to them that what they've said was hurtful, um, was, was inappropriate, was racist in some way. Um, and I think that being in a group or, or having support um, and, and tackling those kind of issues is um, is easier mm. than doing it alone. Yeah. Um, but definitely, if I witnessed any sort of overt or subtle racism, um, I would step in. Most definitely. Yeah. And, um, and try my best to do something to get the message across that it's not okay. Mm. And whether that actually takes effect is yeah. is another <laughs> issue. <laughs> but you know, all you can do is all you can do is try and actually um, do something rather than just stand by. Mm. So, what about you? Have you? What would you do if you experienced it or saw someone else experiencing it? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's quite different for um, like brown people when when racism's going on because if you say anything, the immediate um, understanding among all the white people around when when you say something is that you're being out like outrageous and you're just being completely irrational <clears throat> because all the kinds of racism that you have to deal with, they're all totally normal, you know, like. <clears throat> saying that the university raising fees by the absolute legal maximum every year is racist makes no sense because it's just, you know, it's totally obje objectively necessary. It's an economic necessity. It's just, uh, it's just the way that things happen, you know? <coughs> it melt, like racism like melts down into the structure of society. And so when you try to say like, hey, that's actually informed by racism, everyone's like, what the fuck are you talking about? That's just how we do everything. That's just how it's done. Like it's on railways, you know, like it's on railway tracks. You can't avert it because everyone is like, you're fucking crazy. <clears throat> so it's like, um, the only kinds of racism that you can actually address in person are the kinds that don't matter. Like if someone's just saying like, if someone's using a racial slur, for example, mm. you know, that's informed by, you know, an enormous legacy of like economic and structural violence that telling someone not to use a racial slur, I mean, yeah, they're being a dick, but they're like, it doesn't stop them from going back to their ethnically gated neighborhood, you know? No one's gonna move off of Māori land and give sovereignty back because I've asked them to be nice, you know? Like, so much of how you can address racism is really just addressing politeness. And like, I would love people to be polite to me, but I'd like them to give my land back as well, you know? Mm. <laughs> yeah. 